We don't know too much about the Lunarians, but based on what we do know, there's a real possibility that Oda may flip the story on its head. And you'll know what I mean when we get there. Hey YouTube, Joe Boy here. So, the old adage, the cliche repeated time and again, absolute power corrupts absolutely. The reason why this is a cliche or the reason why this is repeated over and over again by, you know, everybody is because it's true, mostly. Power changes people, and I find that the way that it does this more often than not is the same rules that apply to everybody else no longer apply to you. This I feel like is a relevant discussion when it comes to freedom, right? Freedom is seen as this good thing to be free to do what you want, uh, but some, a lot of people abuse it. Your freedom can infringe upon the freedom of others. That's one way in which it can get out of hand. So oftentimes society itself and rules are used to restrict freedom. And rather than being a bad thing, this is a good thing. But then of course you have the idea of who watches the watchers, right? This is of course as relevant in the real world as it is in One Piece. But again, just sort of speaking philosophically here, I find that, you know, it's really interesting how culture works, right? It's like if, if talk about YouTube culture. It used to be that clickbait titles was not a cool thing to do. Uh, if you did that, you would essentially be shunned by the community. But then one person does it and they really like it and everyone else starts doing it and eventually becomes sort of like an accepted just norm. But the first people who really started just doing it, right, there had to have been either one of two things. They either had to feel a little bit icky about it, like, ah, they're not going to like this, but I'm going to do it anyway because I want to. And or they just have no thoughts whatsoever, like literally, I don't care. You can hate this, you can like this, this is what I I'm going to do, so accept it. That's kind of the mentality that you had to have probably like four or five years ago. And I'm not saying that clickbait titles are bad. I want to make that clear. It's just interesting how these things change. The ugly truth is that the majority of people that exist, I'm sorry if you feel insulted, but you are sheep. I am as well. Most everybody is. We're very, we have clan group herd behaviors. In this way, it's hard to be individualistic. In some respects, it requires a lot of bravery to do so, or a unique constitution to be an individual amongst the crowd. But for the vast majority of people, you look for the crowd's approval in whatever it is that you do. Even if we have to segregate ourselves in many different ways in order to find the right group that you can appeal to. Curating your crowd or not, most people rely on that crowd's approval. Often I find that the group consensus uh, tends to be how people evaluate good from bad, right from wrong. Like here's another uncomfortable truth. There are many societies in the past human groups that loved bloodshed and loved war, rape, pillaging, human sacrifice. These are real parts of human history. I think that some people have it in their mind. They create this headcanon that, oh, these are barbaric people. They're lesser than people. But no, everybody is pretty much the same. And in another universe, in another society or culture, you're amongst the crowd, most likely. It's pretty much unthinkable today, but not even 400 years ago, this was essentially the norm. Talk about the Romans, right? Conquered the world, essentially. They worshipped the Colosseum, an arena of death. You are not more evolved. Simply the definitions of right and wrong has changed, just like people's perceptions of YouTube thumbnails. Drastically different examples, I know, but same concept. But let's not get too lost here. The point of what I'm saying is that if you were born a celestial dragon, it is very likely that you would be Charlos-like. Maybe not as dumb as he is, but in the general way that he sees the world with himself at the center as a god, as greater than, allowed to trample on everyone else, most likely you would be the same. Because this way of thinking, most likely if Charlos was a real person, this way of thinking makes Charlos feel good about himself. The vast majority of people want to feel good about themselves. It's a good thing that, again, the majority here have the perspective to realize that to think of yourself as a god is not a good idea. But we we do this in many different ways, right? Like, you always focus on your positive attributes. You're smarter than those other people. You're more physically able. You're more attractive. Whatever it is about you that makes you feel superior is a thought that typically defines a lot of people. And they dig as deep into the hole as they possibly can because it's fulfilling. We're pleasure seekers by nature. That's how our brain is wired. But it's so interesting how this bisects with freedom. I find in One Piece, Freedom is defined by what characters want. 
right? So it's like what you want, the pursuit of what you want is freedom. And for the vast majority, that's very individualistic, selfish by nature. The feeling of being superior is a, is a sensation, is an experience most seek in whatever small or large way. It's a want. And there are certain ways in which society accepts superiority, where superiority is essentially earned. As just a random example, write test scores. It's an accepted way to create classes of people. Or hell, you could do subscriber count, right? Those who have more subscribers, their say means more. Their opinions tend to be more valued. It's no surprise that, you know, as we're reading One Piece, right, or we like the shonen genre in general, a lot of these stories are about somebody proving their worth gaining recognition and respect. Having respect is a form of power. Being influential, generally speaking, it feels good. It gives people self-worth, confidence, and they do this by honing their skills. These main characters want to become the best because most of us share this sentiment. Being the best is a form of superiority. It feels good, it's very rewarding. But how you do this is dictated by your group, your clan, your culture, or the laws of society. Most everybody enjoys feeling superior, but the ways in which you're allowed to do that uh, can change. So what's the point, JB? Get to the point. This is all very interesting, but this is a video about One Piece. Well, essentially what I'm speculating here, uh, and I think that this is probably true, the Celestial Dragons did not start off as they, as we see them now. I don't think that they were so brazen in their self-superiority when the world government was formed. I think competition is fundamental to being human, and through competition, we constantly push the borders of what is acceptable, right and wrong, good and bad, until things are normalized. Sometimes unthinkable things become normalized. Why did civilizations of the past worship death and destruction? because it led to success. Those that were good at it had all the power. This is coveted and emulated. Anything that's wrong about it is justified because it makes people feel good. These are obviously extreme examples, but this works on the small scale as much as the large. The same concept applies to the celestial dragons. Most likely, you have individual celestial dragons over time that are abusing their powers in particular ways. They do it, they get away with it, there's no repercussions. Other celestial dragons feel jealous, they do it j just the same, it then grows, it becomes normalized. Until 800 years later, you have a pretty horrific group of people. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. This may seem like a huge tangent, but I want you to understand, you know, the inside the minds of a possible celestial dragon, or insight into, like for instance, Sabo tells us, the thing I'm most afraid of is being consumed by this country and becoming a completely different person. It speaks to the challenges of being a noble, being someone who is almost defined as better than, and living in a country where this idea is normalized, and at the same time attempting to stay grounded. So a detail from the story that I haven't really discussed enough is what I think is essentially a confirmation that the gods, before the celestial dragons were gods, the gods were the Lunarians. In chapter 1023, Marco has a flashback of Whitebeard where he remembers that Whitebeard referred to uh, a kingdom of gods which, which used to exist on top of the red line long ago, before Mary Joie was there. And this is added to in chapter 1033 where Queen says this, he can't be the king. That guy's a remnant of the extinct Lunarian tribe, a monster that can survive in any natural environment. In the distant past, gods, that's what they were called. The idea of a true god is a relatively common trope that I see. The gods people should have worship, maybe the creators of the world, benevolent and wise, and have the interests of the people in mind. These gods are defeated by men. And this leads to ruin. I'm not exactly sure what everybody thinks, but I think that people kind of apply this trope to the Lunarians. In some way dismiss their status of God and or uh, they were good gods and the Celestial Dragons are bad ones. And so defeating them was not a good thing. But I would say that my current headcanon is that the Lunarians are another false god. 
a people of tremendous strength which conquered the world essentially. And over a period of time, no matter how they started, eventually got corrupted. So essentially by the time of the Void Century when they were defeated, they were very much like the current Celestial Dragons. They were like the Celestial Dragons, but actually possessed individual fighting strength that can obviously, you can see how it would create fear. All this reminds me of Arlong in Arlong Park, just in the sense that he repeated over and over again that fishmen were the superior race. They were stronger. Humans were pathetic uh, and weak. It's almost this idea of right to rule based on strength. And with the Lunarians being the way that they are, you can see how this kind of ideology might be one that they believed as well. I just think that looking at a race of people that would be just like a king, right? Essentially, they cannot take damage, incredible speed by birth, just incredible genetics by birth. You can understand how this would create a sense of superiority. Eventually, they were worshipped as gods. This is a recipe which creates narcissism. I think that people like to think about life as something that, you know, you're born and then you grow in adolescence, you reach some sort of peak, and then your body starts dying. But the same thing happens to intangible creations as well. What I'm referencing here is just simply government and society. Every great civilization of the past is a civilization of the past because it crumbled and it died. We've already talked about the Romans, so I guess we'll use this as an example as well. But when the Roman, Rome itself was founded, it was found itself righteously. These people called the Etruscans essentially ruled over them. Rome was a province of them. And the kings of the Etruscans, the royalty, the nobles, they abused their powers and Rome rose up and took back their city. With this newfound power uh, and ability to govern themselves, it started off with a bang. They had all these great ideas about how to rule and make it last longer and do it better. In particular, Romans had a great fear of kings. So as the country is sort of born, they place great limitations on the absolute power at the top. But as all things do, it eventually breaks. I think people find the, the cracks, the crevices and how things are in order to strive for themselves. So a few hundred years later, you have this guy named Julius Caesar, who was a great general, person of the people. Everybody loved him. He was one guy with power, but the power was limited until it wasn't, until Rome was an empire and he was the emperor. And even after his death, the lessons of the past are lost because after him is another emperor. I'm not trying to get political here, but I find this relevant to the conversation, just interesting in general, but I'm from the United States, right? And so there's no king, there's no emperor of the United States. You have a presidency, the term is limited, things like this, it's, it's based off of the Roman Republic. Divisions of power. But I would say that the current sentiment that I find with most people, at least that I know, is that we're not really, the it's not functioning as it's supposed to. Think about like the founding fathers of the United States. Of course, they were part of the bourgeois, they were the elite, they were the wealthy, but they also cared a lot. They designed this because it felt like something momentous, that they could be a part of history and they, were individually very learned and, and studied and, and talented without question. And think about the political landscape today, it's just a bunch of clowns. As I say this, I don't find this to be a very controversial statement, as sad as that might be. In the past it was, you know, what can these guys do for the people, for the country itself? A lot of times now, holding political office is about personal gain. Standing for something matters insofar as how it can accumulate votes to maintain power. It's obviously a very deep conversation. I don't want to get too much into it, but you can see some parallels here. Given enough time and allowing uh, discontentment to grow, what you're going to see eventually is a desire for some kind of change. And this tends to be drastic. Basically revolution of one kind or another. It's a very cyclical thing. It, history repeats itself and it happens everywhere. So I do like to apply this to the world of One Piece, like you have a sort of cyclical history where we know that we have gods now, but these gods perhaps replaced former gods. And maybe those did the exact same thing, but the life cycle remains the same. 
I think that the point of this video is gonna go over probably a lot of people's heads because it's relatively nuanced. But for me, thinking about the world of One Piece in this way is completely different than how I did before Onigashima. I kind of thought that the world before the Void Century was open and free. Yes, there was kings, but they were self-contained within islands, and there wasn't any sort of over overarching force which ruled over everyone. And to me, this made sense because of the sea. The sea is this barrier uh, of travel. It separates everyone. To get from one island to another is difficult. If you study warfare, right, trying to cross uh, a sea with an entire army to conquer another you know, an island nation is not an easy thing to do. Like for instance, Great Britain or Japan. Those are some of the most difficult countries to conquer because of the barrier of the sea. As I view the world of One Piece as a lot of different islands, conquering the world becomes a very difficult task. And as a side note with this explained, you can possibly theorize as to the reason that the world government is building the bridge at Tequila Wolf or those bridges in general. You can see the, the purpose that they could serve or how what they could relate to historically. Again, talking about the Romans, one of the, the key inventions the Romans uh, or the key projects which allowed them to conquer the vast majority of Europe was simply good roads. Seriously. But then Oda introduced a insanely strong species or race that has the ability to fly. The sea is not an obstacle. If the baseline strength of this race is essentially king, they are one-man armies. But with this perspective, it changes how you might view the 20 kingdoms and the original celestial dragons. Like, perhaps they fought self-righteously against their overlords, the Lunarians, who either started as bad rulers or eventually corrupted and abused their power. I love all of these thoughts because it makes the conflict more gray. It's not good versus evil. It's like some weird amalgamation of, of all of it. And that's, in my opinion, very realistic. But of course, we want to come to some conclusion. And we've already talked about Perhaps this is like a cyclical thing, right? Revolution, basically. We know very little about the Void Century, but what we do know is that there was some sort of ancient kingdom which existed, which was very powerful and associated with the initial D. Clover theorizes that these people fought against the 20 kings, which went on to form the world government. So this being true, the ancient kingdom must have been defeated. If the Lunarians were gods which abused their power, did the D stand with them or against them, or what was their role? So the theory that I've had since before I even had a YouTube channel, it's pretty much the most integral theory to anything that I speculate regarding the Void Century, it's that the Ancient Kingdom was a kingdom of pirates. Not going to get into all the details here, but Suffice it to say that it's a pretty popular theory, uh, one that I've never faced too much backlash for. It's something that could definitely make sense. But when you think about pirates, you don't really associate them as defenders of gods, right? They're just kind of a chaotic force. Going back to the idea of things being cyclical, right? It's like back during the Void Century, it's very likely that the pirates of that day are about what you see with the pirates of the current era which means that they're very diverse. So assuming that theory is true, and we're not gonna say that again, but just keep in mind, it is a theory. But assuming that theory is true, I think that Luffy is going to recreate the ancient kingdom. Essentially, it's a kingdom that is fragmented. It's broken into pieces because you don't have a king. So once you have a king, Luffy will bring the pirate world together and then you'll have the ancient kingdom in all its glory. We made this video recently, but Luffy is going to bring everyone together. Not just pirates, but pretty much everybody from every faction in the world, including uh, actual countries and kings. The power of friendship. Luffy's great ability. I don't think that this is going to face too much backlash, but another pretty, I think, obvious thought. Joy Boy, right? Joy Boy was like a Luffy-like character from the Void Century who probably did the exact same thing. We've been talking about revolution and Joy Boy is 
the drums of, of liberation. So at this point, you should probably guess where I'm going with this, but if things are cyclical and the Lunarians were the gods of their time, essentially the celestial dragons, and you have pirates, which is a chaotic force that has all sorts of different agendas, but you have a Luffy-like character like Joy Boy who brings the world together because of a common foe that's more likely to have been the Lunarians than the, the 20 kings who formed the world government. In fact, the 20 kings very well could have been a part of Joy Boy's army. They fought together. I've speculated this before, but it actually gains strength now that you know that there's another god. I think that this makes the most sense when keeping to the context of what we know right now, the present timeline. Luffy, Pirate King, bringing the world together, fighting against the evil, right? After that battle is is over and perhaps they've they've won, what happens then? Does Luffy control the world, right? Is he king of the world now? No, that is not what Luffy wants. So then you have a grab for power, one in which Luffy is probably not going to involve himself in. The various kingdoms or countries that are aligned with him are now have to replace whatever system existed before. Or perhaps they don't have to, but maybe they feel compelled to or they need to. You could say that it's kind of sus that the 20 kings made themselves gods, right? They became the celestial dragons, but we know that even the joy boy of the past probably became a god in his own way, the sun god Nika. It appears as if the people, just your everyday Joe, they need or they want gods to believe in, to rule them, to be their heroes, maybe not dissimilar to ancient Europe, the Greeks and the Romans. We've talked about this before, but the pirates can't rule the world. Uh, Luffy can't create a system in which he is king even if he wanted to because it's incredibly dangerous. Going back to Rome fearing kings, right? You're at the mercy of their whims and their disposition. Regardless of how you feel about Luffy, Luffy is one person and someday he will die. But all this power that he'll accumulate by the conclusion of the story, uh, that will have been earned because Luffy is simply more powerful. Everything that he has will have been taken from other factions, other forces, the world government itself. It's like the ideal interpretation of might is right. He's taken the reins of the world because of his ability. Luffy is not elected, right? He just is the person capable. In a way, he's a lot like Julius Caesar. But in a world run and ruled by pirates where might is right, the next pirate may be Blackbeard. And then the world is destroyed. You need some kind of system. Rules and laws. The pirate world doesn't work. And you need some kind of division of powers. Even with the world government and the celestial dragons, this exists because there is more than one celestial dragon. They have Agurose, which is a council of five. We're not talking about Emu because that's a curiosity. I actually do think that it's quite fitting that Emu is a secret entity. Not very many people know about him, maybe because his existence was never what was intended. But as the world sees it, right, there's these things are in place. But going back to Luffy at the conclusion of the final battle, he's essentially this force of chaos that will storm in, turn the world upside down, and then he's going to do what he wants to do, which is to adventure with his friends and fight the people who directly threaten them. And everything else is going to be left up to the people that desire order and control. It's going to be up to them to design a new future that will appease their people, likely with some small improvement over the regime that came before. This could be a lot of things. First off, we know that the Lunarians was a race that was incredibly individually powerful, replaced by humans, which is pretty much the exact opposite, right? I know that there are powerful humans, but it's, we're not given the impression that the celestial dragons really are that are like that. And so that could be seen as an improvement. Our new gods are not impossible to defeat monsters. Another thing that I think is worthy of just throwing out into the abyss is how did the Lunarians rule as gods? Where did they did they police the oceans like 
like the world government does now with the Marines. I know that the Marines do a lot of bad things, but they do a lot of good things too. Basically, what I'm saying is we're the pirates out of control. For most of the time, the Lunarians rule. Did they not enforce any order upon them or protect their people at all? So then the Marines, as a organization, could have been created initially as a better solution. I do wonder whether the Lunarians sort of set the stage for the current racism and and slavery that takes place in the world. Like, there's a bias against these very strong tribes, non-humans. Is it possible that the Lunarians actually favored groups like the Fishmen or the Minks, uh, and, but not humans? Because humans were literally the weakest, a lesser class by nature. Do you guys see how this discussion turns everything you know on top of itself? You could very well have a situation like the Romans and the Etruscans, or countless other examples from history. The Romans eventually got fed up and fought for their freedom, and then they won, and then they enslaved the Etruscans. One of the things that Oda has commented on before, specifically in Fishman Island, is this cycle of hatred, and Odohime doesn't want it to influence the children. But it's a, it's a very real thing. So thinking about the story from this way, you have two possibilities. One is the Fishmen and other tribes, perhaps giants, where it's actually on the side, in general, of the Lunarians and were favored races. Or on the flip side, maybe they weren't, but the humans created this narrative that all non-humans were against them. They, it's essentially propaganda or maybe a fear. All non-humans are bad. If you're somebody like Luffy, what do you do then? You might think that this is a ridiculous question to ask, but I really, I really don't think so. Because we have the ongoing plot of the Fishmen and the Mer people, and we know that they're, it's very capable that this sentiment can bloom in their community that humans are fundamentally bad. They are nasty, evil creatures by nature. Luffy has a friend who is Jimbei. Jimbei who wants what's best for the Fishmen. Fishmen are the oppressed group, the one that Luffy should be fighting for. But what if after he wins, the Fishmen want to enslave all the humans? How do you win then? I'm not saying that this is going to happen, because I think that we're going to be left with a very satisfying conclusion to the story of One Piece. But these concepts, I think, as they are played with in the present, could have also related to the past. It makes me wonder what's changed now like does it matter that luffy is a human which would if you equated this to the void century based on our discussion make him a lunarian from the past fighting against his own race's supremacy is this a critical difference but anyway this is a subject that can spider off in many different directions even as i'm explaining this to you right you see all the tangents that i can go on we can go even deeper we didn't even talk about lunarians being from the moon, for instance, there's all sorts of things to talk about, but let's not, let's end the video here. Perhaps we'll pick up this conversation again when uh, I make a video on Ragnarok, which I think could be very related. But just so we're clear here, I want to summarize the main points and why I felt like this video was worth making. I had it in my mind for many years that uh, this, this current story is a continuation of the fight from the Void Century. Essentially, the bad guys won and we're just waiting for the good guys to win. But with the Lunarians being the former gods, the gods before these celestial dragons, it begins to make me think whether history is cyclical. So rather than an unfinished fight, the fight is repeating and possibly has done so even before the Void Century. And then from here, you just wonder what the celestial dragons or what the 20 kingdoms role in this fight was. But at the very least, you can understand how Joy Boy of the Void Century would be put in a tough position, fighting for what's right, but then you give the power to those that you freed, and it oppresses others. Things like Joy Boy's promise take on new meaning. You know, it's like you think that, oh wow, the Celestial Dragons forced the Fishmen uh, to go into the sea from even before the Void Century, and they just want to live up on the surface, but instead, Joy Boy frees the people and in order to prevent more war because They still don't get along with the non-humans you Joy Boy tell the fishmen to go live under the sea Until the time is right that you can mend the relationship. It's like being caught between two difficult choices You understand the pain 
of the oppressed. But you also understand that a lot of their anger is misdirected. So to prevent wars against, you know, to protect your friends, basically, you separate them. Minks go live up on Zoe, fishermen go into the surface, Tantata go hide in the forest. The apology in this context would make a lot of sense. Like, I never meant for this to happen to you. You weren't deserving of this fate. I was only doing what I thought was right, and I never thought that it would come to this. But if you stay on the surface, there will be endless war. So after the Lunarians were defeated, perhaps Joy Boy spent the rest of his life trying to create conditions on the surface, such that the, the Fishmen and others could use Noah to, to live together, and he failed. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much what I had to say. I hope that it was understandable. If you enjoyed this, give the video a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe. The break is inching towards its end, but it is coming. As always, though, I'm curious as to what you guys think. Leave your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, have a wonderful day.